We're glad that you found us here at Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in North Liberty, Iowa. I'm Pastor Katie on behalf of Pastor Tim, the Vision and Council, and the Holy Trinity family. Welcome. It's so great to spend a little time together to just pause, put all your distractions aside, and let's just find some time to worship together. Before we get into all of our um, beautiful time together, can we just go through a few announcements? All of our announcements are always found on our webpage at holytrinitynl.org. You'll find the most up-to-date information that we have there, and also, you'll also find all of our information about Christmas Eve. Let's get that announcement out there. It's going to be an exciting evening, but more importantly, it'll be a meaningful evening. We invite you to bring your families along to just get in the car, stay in your jammies, because we're going to worship outside together in your cars, except for one point. We want to get out of our cars and lift up our voice. We'll lift up our candles together and uh, we'll sing outside only this year. We know it's going to be a once in a lifetime kind of experience. Don't miss it. We need you to let us know when you're coming. There's a survey that's gone out. It's been on our e-blast and it's available, I believe, online or will be soon. And we want to know if you're coming at worship at 4, 6, or 8. We have just enough parking spots. We know one of those spots has your name on it, but we want to make sure we know when you're coming so that we can have room for everybody. So please fill out the survey. Let us know. Times again are at 4, 6, and 8. Other announcements we have this coming weekend uh, on Sunday morning. We can worship together, but also send, spend time together in children's Sunday school and adult Sunday school. Both of those um, Zoom accounts or links are available on our website uh, that went out on Friday afternoon. Also, we have coming up uh, a special evening called Finding Hope. It is a time when you just put a pause and uh, take in those feelings that feel they're your feelings, but they may not be feelings that you're seeing all around you. It seems that everybody's filled with all this joy and your feelings are a little bit different or a little off, but they're yours and they count and they um, are uh, in here to be experienced. Come to this time called Finding Hope at 630. Again, that Zoom link was in our e-blast on Friday. Invite a friend to come along with you. We'll be Zooming only, but I'm going to invite you to just find a time to, to hear some scripture, to say a prayer together, to just pause and name your feelings and be okay being not okay for a while. But that's your journey. So that's going to happen at 630. Please don't miss it. We have lots of other announcements, as, including um, don't forget to get those uh, pledge cards in so we know um, how our 2021 year is going to be. We're excited. We have amazing things planned ahead. So much more. Go to our webpage. That's all the announcements I have. I want to just center our hearts now. The Lord be with you and also with one another. Amen. That mourns in glory, exile 
The Lord be with you. O Lord, stir up your power and come. Come here into our midst where we might humbly receive your word and your sacrament. Come to us once again as a child at Bethlehem that we might celebrate all over again that incarnation and what it means for us. Come to us in bread and in wine and in ways that we can not only hear about your grace but taste it. Take it into ourselves so that we become part of your body and part of your work in this season. Lord, welcome to our worship once again. May this be the gift to you that we intend it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, boys and girls. Thanks for joining us for the children's time today. You know, I found a book in the church nursery today that reminded me of our Bible story for this morning. It's a book, it's called I Spy, and some of you are familiar with these. You probably have one of your own, maybe a, a small version like this, or maybe one of the larger ones. But whatever the case may be, it's fun to open these up and look for things that don't show up maybe at first glance, that are maybe a challenge to find. But when you do find them, it's fun to rejoice over that. Where's Waldo? It's another book that kind of has the same idea behind it, right? Or just going on a treasure hunt, similarly. I know that my wife has shown me uh, some videos of classrooms where teachers are having fun hiding a baby Yoda around the classroom and all the joy that the kids are having looking for that every day. Or maybe you, your parents or your teacher has an elf somewhere that they've hidden around that they want you to find. Whatever the case may be, it's fun to go on a treasure hunt of sorts that way, to look for things that perhaps we don't see at first glance. Well, as I thought about that, uh, the story in the Bible today reminds me about how God's invited us to like, go on a hunt as well, to look for ways in particular that we can share God's love, to watch for, to seek out, to be opening our eyes to opportunities that we can do that every day in a way that brings a smile to someone's face or brings relief to someone's pain or brings joy to someone's heart. I think about some of you who have drawn amazingly cool artwork and you've given that to me on a Sunday morning as a gift. And I look at that and I go, wow, is that cool? And it ends up on my office wall. Or I think of, of others of you who, who wave to me when I, I, I we do a, a Zoom Bible study with your parents and, and you're in the background waving to those who are, are part of the screen. Or for that matter, when I'm out walking my dog in the neighborhood and somebody I don't get a chance to see very often says, hey, Pastor Tim, and makes the effort to shout out and greet me. That brings joy to my heart too. All of those are ways and so many more that we can look for ways to be part of bringing God's story of love that knows no limits to birth. And so as we await the coming of Jesus as a baby of Bethlehem, it means we don't have to wait till December 24th or 25th to practice that God's love or to look for ways of, of using our gifts to share that love because every day we have that opportunity Every day, we have treasures like this that might seem hidden. But once we look for them and find them and celebrate them, God rejoices with us all over again. Will you join me in prayer? Let's pray. God, thank you for being our God today, for inviting us to be part of your story, and for helping us to look for ways to share your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1. 
In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as a priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you the good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, This is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment that was spoken to her by the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Good morning and welcome. We are using this uh, journey of Advent together uh, to do something rather special. That's to take the time to highlight both the witness and the gifts of women in the biblical account and story, specifically those within Jesus' own family tree, and also the gifts and witness of women in today's church, especially serving as pastors now for the past half century. This is the 50th year that we have been blessed to have their leadership among us in that particular capacity. And biblically speaking, you know, we've been talking in past weeks about Sarah and about Hannah, and we could just as easily have told stories of Rebecca or Rachel or Tamar or Rahab, perhaps of, of Ruth or Bathsheba, because all of them played a part in the history of God's people. All of them were part of Jesus' own family tree. But in this Advent season of active waiting and preparation for Christ's coming at Bethlehem, we are choosing to focus instead on those who were intimately connected with the Christmas story itself. First Elizabeth this week, and then Mary next week, both of whom, by the way, were part of our account this morning, and both of whom I believe have an awful lot 
to teach us. I say that because despite all of their many differences in age, in geography, whatever it may be, Elizabeth and Mary were each able and willing somehow to say yes, ultimately, to something outside of their own aspiration and their own vision, their own timetable. They were each able to open their eyes and their imaginations to actively seek how it was that God might choose to use them in a way that, again, didn't fit their own idea, didn't fit their own, didn't fit their own schedule, as the Lord knows, but that might have fit God's vision instead. So as we'll recall next week, I mean, Mary was bold enough as a relatively powerless young teenager to say a proactive, let it be, yes, to a prospect that had to be so far beyond her own young adolescent imagination that her initial question, how can this be, had to be one that must have echoed in her head hundreds if not thousands of times. And as we'll learn, Elizabeth's willingness to affirm a similarly unbelievable, unimaginable plan was rooted in a much longer preparation. So let's take some time, shall we? Review a little bit of their, their story and our lesson today, and, and then, after recalling some of the nuances, that, to ask what kinds of, of insights or what kind of practices we might discern from it. Consider Elizabeth's circumstance, for starters. I mean, she had a lot in common with, with again, Sarah and with Hannah from past weeks in that she was one who, who had a, a loving and devoted husband, in this case, Zechariah, who served at the temple. And because of, of his role, she had a certain amount of economic status and comfort and, and social standing. And yet for all of that, now that she had reached her elder years Elizabeth still had one missing link, one giant void, no children. The thing that a, a woman in her day, to which they might have mattered most, her ability to carry on the family tree. So once she had been, been, been found herself as a young woman, kind of wounded by all the different judgments of those around her who had their own children, even she didn't have her own all the ridicule that, that she, she heard going on and being muttered underneath the breath of folks in the marketplace. But now, now she'd probably gotten kind of accustomed to that wound of, of infertility. Yeah, she had pleaded and prayed once for a son. Yes, she too had petitioned and, and bargained with God, promising to give her child back to God for service in the temple, much like his father She'd promised a lot of that one day. And she'd actively and diligently fasted and prayed and tithed and kept the Sabbath and tried her best to live a righteous life, to be a person of integrity, all the while clinging to her dream of motherhood. And now that was long in the past because Elizabeth had since likely set aside any such notions, even if her many disciplines have continued and survived. That day, she felt, was past until, until the angel Gabriel came and visited and brought news to her husband that their longing to be parents was soon to be a reality after all. Elizabeth was with child, and the special child at that, and the one who would come and lead the way for the Messiah, no less. And now, if her, if her past prayers for how God might use her were had previously unexpected directions, well, this one sure as heck was as well. And Scripture suggests, as Elizabeth received this news, and then she, for the first five months of her pregnancy, she moved into isolation, kind of alone in her anticipation. Sure, she had Zechariah, He's a little better listener now than he used to be, now that he couldn't talk, as, as the Scripture says, but he was still a male. He couldn't relate. And all the, the local women who were her contemporaries, her friends, were long past this adventure of, of, of pregnancy. They were perhaps becoming, becoming grandmothers, if anything. So while I'm no expert on the experience, I can imagine that Elizabeth likely had to feel kind of alone in a sea of 
of confusing and amazing and conflicting emotions, maybe from curiosity to confusion, ranging from excitement to maybe a little depression now and then, perhaps everything in between. And she longed for somebody she could trust to talk to, somebody who, who might begin to understand her very unique situation. Meanwhile, Mary, her much younger cousin, Mary, who lived miles and miles and miles away, was wrestling with a similar visit from Gabriel with news that had to be even more disorienting for her. She, too, we learn, was with child, only much too young to understand what that even meant and what motherhood implied, and much too worried, perhaps, no doubt, as to what Joseph, her fiancé, would think. She, too, I suspect, even after saying, yes, let it be, Long for somebody to talk to, somebody who, who knew what it meant with God's often bewildering ideas and intentions, someone who, who, who she could trust, someone who maybe was even pregnant, like herself. And so the scripture says that Mary makes the journey, makes the journey right away to go and visit Elizabeth, who opens her arms and her home to this relative whom her neighbors might well have expected her to reject, given her questionable situation. But instead of shaming Mary for her circumstance, Elizabeth welcomes her. She blesses her. She celebrates her. She cherishes her company and treats her as royalty, as more honorable and she herself. And here's the thing. When you stop and think about it, Elizabeth didn't have to do that. How many people in her situation might have felt jealous or resentful instead of Mary's being chosen instead of her? But that is, that is not at all what Elizabeth does. Rather, she rejoices. She celebrates this news. And I can't help but believe that her openness to God's unlikely alternative plan here and her willingness to be second fiddle here, as it were, and see the joy in that, see the blessing in that wasn't the result of that long season of obedience and discipline that had taught her so very much. No, being at center stage apparently wasn't God's vision for her or for her son, John the Baptist, for that matter, who ended up not exactly serving in the temple alongside his father, but rather adopting a rather eye-opening lifestyle involving caves and a locust diet and a whole lot of shouting. <laughs> Yet somehow, somehow all of those years of, of asking how it was that God might use her today led her to a place of peace with what was instead of worrying what might have been. And I suspect something similar could be said for Mary, too. I mean, she, too, was looking, again, forward to something quite different than the deck that she has had then dealt to her, right, as a teenager. But in each case, these two faithful women were willing to actively embrace a vision that went well beyond their own dreams and imagination, something that ultimately served not their own will at their own respective points in life, but rather God's. They remind me, for example, of, uh, of a daily routine that Adam Hamilton, pastor down in Kansas City, has long practiced in his life as a disciple of Jesus. Because for the past 30 years, Hamilton writes how he, he begins each day by literally getting down on his knees at his bed, folding his hands, and praying that God might find a way to use him that day for God's purposes. Every day. For three years, she does that. And that prayer could lead a direction that might be something that easy to predict or expect, especially serving in his role as he does. But it might just as easily lead him to a place, or any of us for that matter, to a point where we couldn't begin to imagine what that might mean. It's a humbling reminder, isn't it, to me, to, of what it oftentimes really requires for us to really have the chance and take the chance to actually do what God might be asking us to do. How might you, God, use me today? 
How might I serve your will? Open my heart, open my eyes, open my calendar, my wallet, all of that so I can discover what that might be. A simple question, but boy, is it a profound one. And can you perhaps picture Elizabeth asking the very same thing? Lisa and I have been asking that question rather frequently in, in recent weeks, recalling what we know of Hamilton and, and wondering again, you know, how, how it is that we are being asked to be used. That's something that's haunted us uh, almost daily. And, and again, maybe the same might be said for many of you. But right now, how is God asking you to be used? Is it maybe, is he seeking to use, to, to use you to support uh, the loved ones around you in this trying season? That's no small thing for a lot of us. Is he, is he seeking perhaps to use you to care for or look out for an elderly or vulnerable neighbor who, who doesn't feel safe venturing out during this, this scary season? Maybe it is asking you to use you to do your best to cover for colleagues who are recovering from COVID or the virus. Maybe it's, it's to vulnerably break the ice between you and a friend with whom you've, you've had a falling out. God may be asking you to take that first step. Maybe God's seeking to use you today just to be a voice for, for justice for somebody who doesn't share the, the support and the privilege that you and I oftentimes take for granted. How is it that God might be asking you to be used for God's purposes today? It's late last Wednesday afternoon. I was here at church, and, and I was winding up some recording we'd been doing for this morning, and I, I found myself needing to kind of still get home and, and, to, and to, to post up the whole evening prayer service that had been recorded but still had to be uploaded, and all that takes some time to do, whether on YouTube or Facebook or however we do it. And I was just getting ready to leave, just getting ready to, ready to, to head back home and do so, and when Pastor Katie introduced me to a guest who had come to the front door which we kept open for ventilation purposes. His name was Kim, and he was seeking some assistance. And it was one of those situations, one of those times when there were all kinds of elements to, to what he shared with me that just seemed impossible to meet, all kinds of obstacles that, that just would seem rather evident that there's no way we're going to be able to do this. There were significant dollars involved, a short time frame, a third party, a language barrier, too late in the day to verify all the details of the story, Just my own busyness, my own need to be somewhere else, all reasons that might have just as easily provided a rationale for listening compassionately, yes, but then saying, I'm so sorry, I'm just not able to do that. I'm not able to help. But it was also evident that Kim had, had exhausted his resources, that he had tried diligently to find the support that he needed, and his desperation was significant. And so I couldn't help but wonder, you know, is God trying to use me in this situation? Something that, that, that I had paused to pray that day after recalling Hamilton's practice, something I was wrestling with because of preparation for this sermon. The ask was, was certainly too large to expect the church to cover. And so I took the gentleman's number and, and his name and all that, and I headed home to get ready for worship. And, and I asked Lisa, if, you know, if perhaps we could extend him the loan that he was asking for, do so it ourselves instead. And later that evening, that's exactly what I did. Wondering all the while if I'd either been played the fool or at least if I'd ever see those funds again so that perhaps I might be able to offer them again when the need arise for someone else. But in the process, I, I heard more of and learned more of Kim's story, more of what refugees like him have had to go through to get to this place, more certainly of his deep gratitude for my willingness to treat him as a human being and choose to take a risk. I got a text Friday morning saying, Pastor Tim, I'll meet you at your church at 10 a.m. Saturday to repay that loan. <laughs> He'd gotten his paycheck. And when the snowstorm came and wiped out Saturday morning, I got another text that said, I'll meet you there at 11.30 tomorrow. See you then. And I'll bet you that he's here. Now, you know, the point isn't that. The point is that whether he comes or not, I had an opportunity to be used by God. 
I had an opportunity to step outside of my own agenda and see where it was that God might be nudging me beyond my initial instincts. They have the opportunity to listen and to be learn, to learn and to make a new friend. I couldn't help but ask, you know, if I would have recognized that opportunity I was given that day without first asking that question, God, how will you use me today? How about you? Can you perhaps see yourself being as diligent as Elizabeth in your own lifelong disciplines or active listening for God's direction that you would hear that invitation, that challenge when it come? If not, what might be preventing you from doing so, do you think? What's getting in the way? Or can you ask yourself, again, what it would take for you to be as open as Elizabeth and allowing God to direct your only child's future, even if it was in quite a different direction than maybe what you yourself had first envisioned? Can you ask what it might mean to be as trusting as actively pondering and seeking and listening as Mary, even at her young and impressionable age. How might you respond if God were to come and plant within you a sacred vision that would in fact upset all of your rhythms and values and balance and your very existence? How would you perhaps make time to nurture and feed the embodiment of that vision even if it were not your own? Now, truth be told, of course, a lot of times we don't know what God's purposes are and what God's vision is. We don't know what the plan is, certainly, or we can't say for certain that we do. All we can say is that we understand that God and God's values and God's kingdom and God's, God's willingness to share comes in the form of humility and kindness and reaching out and second chances and grace after grace after grace. And more often than not, I have to wonder, you know, is that the shape of my vision too or only God's? More often than I'm afraid, I've tended to come up with my own vision rather than waiting for God's. Come up with my own then expected God to bless that, whether it served God's ultimate purposes or not. I've been the captain of my own ship but oftentimes hasn't paused long enough to really listen for God's direction before moving according to my own compass. And even when I have paused to do so, I've often failed to again do that active work of investment and nurturing that vision, whatever it may be, waiting for God to do all the work or carry all the burden when it comes to going a different direction that I may have first hoped or assumed. I have to ask myself again, how maybe have I missed the chance to be used all these days, all these years, all these opportunities? Maybe, again, you can relate. Whatever the case may be, we recall, listening again to the story of Elizabeth and her cousin, that Mary could have simply been too intimidated, could have simply said, oh no, go pick someone else, angel, you got the wrong person. Likewise, Elizabeth could have been, again, resentful, jealous maybe, whether, again, for herself or for John, or she could have just been cool to the whole idea. But that was not what she did. She was willing and able to joyfully be used by God as God saw fit, to serve faithfully in a secondary role, to celebrate, encourage, and support Mary's place in history as the mother of our Lord. Would that each of us have the courage and have the discipline and have the opportunity to do the same, to ask how it is that we might today be used for God's purpose and then play our own part in birthing God's vision in our midst. Amen.
I invite you now to pray with me. When I say, um, hear us, O God, I invite you and your household to say, to answer, your mercy is great. Would you pray with me, please? God of power and might, shine your radiance and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming the good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to public worship. Lord, we know you hear us. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God of every living creature, you announce the year of your favor for all your creation. Extend your kindness and relief to endangered animals and planets. Strengthen the human beings who rely on the rhythms of nature to make their living. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with leaders of every nation as they govern. Give them a spirit of righteousness, that your goodness and mercy is revealed through their actions. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. God of exiles and wanderers, you repair what was once destroyed. We pray for your people who have been displaced from their homes by fire, flood, earthquake, or storm. God, we ask, that we continue to support the work of Lutheran World Relief, Lutheran Disaster Response, and all relief organizations and their recovery efforts. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. God of all powerfulness and helpless, you clothe us and strengthen us with your spirits when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower one another as a continued community to comfort those who turn to you and to us in their time of need. Make your church a place of refuge and healing. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. God of sinners and saints, you offer joy even in the midst of our grief. We are grateful for, your, for the beloved, imperfect people whose lives testify to your radiant love. Anoint all who mourn with, oil, with an oil of gladness. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. Draw us near to you, O oh God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite you now to share in a time of peace. The peace be with you and also me, and now share your peace with your household. Okay. With the whole church, let us confess our sins before God and one another. For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. And to the glory of your holy name, amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are indeed forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, gave it to all to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. I want you to eat of this and remember me. At that same supper, he took a cup and he gave thanks. 
He gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of all sin, for all people. I want you to drink of this and remember me. Now let us pray. The prayer our Lord has taught us. Together we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I invite you now to take your bread, your crackers, what you have found that you are going to share in your household, and go ahead and break those pieces and share it with one another and say these words, the body of Christ is given for you. And then I want you to take your cup and you may either drink it or dip your bread into it and say, the blood of Christ is shed for you. Go ahead and share that now with your loved ones in your household. And now hear this blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may it strengthen you and keep you in his grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we go out now, hear this message of being sent out into the world. May you go to love, live, and share Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>